communities in this great state. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, if I can get this microphone adjusted. We're going to go ahead and get started with the... Uh, I'm going to call up Amy Johnson with the Aviation Authority since she's probably got one of the shorter presentations. Amy, so we're going to, you may want to stick around, but we'll give you that opportunity if you want to just go ahead and, and uh, present your budget. And <laughs> Let me turn your mic on there too, okay? Again, the purpose of the Aviation Authority is to provide the fixed wing passenger transportation services. The governor's recommendation for 18 is to eliminate our state funds. That's fine with us. We will be using the proceeds from the sale of the current hangar to operate. Um, and below is just a breakdown of our expenses for 18. Okay. Any questions from the committee? 19, Representative Beverly. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the sale of the hangar, I think we, we had a discussion about this, but the sale of the hangar costs, I mean, what, what are you going to get from that? And then is there going to be some surplus that's there will be beyond that? And then how, much, how many years would that surplus cover the cost of the your hangar operations? sold for $8 million. Right. We purchased a smaller hangar for about 1.4 million we're having some modifications done to the facility so we will end up with about 5.8 million after all of the the purchase of the new hangar and the modifications Just a quick follow sure uh, the so that five 5.8 million mm -hmm. that will cover what operational expenses for one year two years five years the it's the intent to continue to operate um, until the funds are no longer available. But so. is, there, is there a timetable associated with uh, that? At least five years, at yes. Least five. Okay. Representative Lariccia. Um This is probably just a question out of nowhere, but I had a constituent uh, catch me several months ago before I had even known that I was going to be appointed to this committee and asked me about the Aviation Museum in Warner Robins, that it was created by the General Assembly, mm -hmm. and that there's no, maybe there's no funding for that anymore. And, I, and I, it's kind of a general question maybe to the committee and to you or those that may know. Are you familiar it, with, with and that at all? And we're not connected. Not connected to that at all? No, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess transportation is in no way involved in that either. No. It's no. Oh, okay, okay. That was, answers my question. <laughs> um, we have one more question. Uh, and I probably missed it when I was <coughs> down there speaking to some uh, some of the people here. But uh, wh which hangar is this that sold? Is that the main one that uh, Southern Bell used to have? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Well, where's the new one going to be? I used to be on the Aviation Authority. Yeah. I, really, I remember. Yeah. Um, we're actually on the other end of um, MLK. Same area. Yes, it's yeah, okay. the same airport, just a smaller Anger. Okay, and you don't have no more questions, Ms. Johnson. Thank you for coming and presenting the 18 budget. Thank and, you. And uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to the Georgia Department of Transportation and call on Commissioner Russell McMurray. And this is not the first time he's presented parts of his 18 budget. So, like I said last time, thanks for. Working with us as we focus more on transportation with this subcommittee that's dedicated to transportation and infrastructure. So, my, my pleasure, Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I try not to give you too much of a rerun. Nobody likes reruns, but what I will do is give you again an overview of the bigger parts of the budget. And as we did with the FY17 to this committee, sort of highlight a few of the key components and not take a deep dive in all of them. On the first slide is again the overall budget presentation in categories, taking a little, taking a little bit different look than what's in your budget uh, book itself. The FY18 proposed budget is 1.99 billion dollars. 1.99. I wish we could just round, and make it to two, but may, amended. I'm, I'm optimistic that amended 18 
we'll be talking in the twos and that that is a very uh, robust budget and we take it very seriously about deploying that so what we want to do again is I highlight I think this is very important as you look at the bottom of that slide you see some percentages across the bottom that's the percent share of the state budget so under capital projects and we'll take a deeper dive on that one but you can see that capital projects is 47 percent of the state funds general operations and if you think about operating a business 10 percent sort of that overhead kind of cost of doing business very reasonable lmig is by formula by 10 percent uh, routine maintenance preventive maintenance 23 percent so when you when you add the capital projects and routine maintenance together you can see the lion's share of our budgets out there getting work done in a very efficient manner and then payments to SERTA and geo debt and we'll talk about those in detail so let's move over to the next slide which would be slide three um, talk about capital but capital projects lumped together that's 937 million dollars which coincidentally is probably a little bit more than our budget was in FY 14 15 about the same almost almost a billion I guess in 15 so that's pretty staggering where we'll be able to deploy that much into capital projects which used to be our entire state budget so capital projects is really made up of three budget categories the first one of those is capital construction that I've talked to you about that's everything about building projects uh, designing buying right away doing environmental and really building them and so what the ad is for FY18 is $85 million, $85.7 million, which will go toward advancing those projects, those capital projects. But out of that 85, we're going to take $7 million, go back to our districts to do the quick response program, of which there was already uh, $15 million appropriated in the base budget. So those are those little turn lanes. You can add a turn lane, make extend turn lanes, little runarounds maybe even a small roundabout so we're excited about giving some uh, more ability to make some spot improvements throughout your districts throughout the state in uh, that category the next component of capital project budget uh, and this is about page 371 i believe or page 90 on the tracking sheet uh, is capital maintenance so we're adding amending in or asking for an additional 39.3 million dollars into capital maintenance and that does exactly what it says that will go toward resurfacing uh, rehabilitation of roads and bridges so uh, that is a tremendous add there and the final component of the capital projects budget is the local roads admin of which there's no change we're not adding anything there and again that is a small amount of dollars that allows us to uh, utilize federal funds for the transportation enhancement projects until the local gov governments provide their match the next slide is again taking that capital projects budget and what does that really translate into infrastructure improvement for Georgia our forecast right now for fiscal year 18 is bidding out 1.429 uh, billion dollars I think about that 1.429 billion dollars of projects okay and that does not include TIA or any local projects that's that's just what we advance and if you think about the TIA regions that have T splashed but what also the capital projects budgets consist of were the things I mentioned the design the environmental the right of way all the coordination it takes and when you look at there's 364 projects there just to be bid out when you total up the other projects for design 105 projects will be under design in FY 18 that's new design projects not ones that are underway we'll have 93 projects that means we're moving into buying right away on 93 projects throughout the state and then you can see the 306 projects there when you sum all those up it's about 1.7 billion dollars of federal and state when you leverage the federal dollars so that's a tremendous big increase in seeing that kind of investment in fact the right away the right away uh, forecast federal and state is about 450 million dollars historically we were st we stayed in the 150 to a good year was maybe 200 million dollars in right away so again you can see these dollars being deployed and that they're going to be moving a lot of projects in the early phases of the projects uh, along in FY18 the next budget category is general operations at 205.2 million dollars uh, this is over on uh, on page 90 of the HB 44 tracking sheet and we'll start with the construction admin construction admin is all those offices that are necessary to advance those projects to get them out to bid and then manage them so that is the support functions including bidding and procurement 
Uh, so we have a, a request of 4.5, an additional $4.5 million. Uh, about uh, 1.3 of that goes toward the merit-based pay adjustment uh, provided in the governor's recommendation. Uh, the next item we have is just the overall administration. When you think about HR, legal, IT, all those things, and we have a, uh, an additional $2.35 million there. About 680000 of that is going toward merit-based and pay. The other part of that's going toward our uh, small business, veteran-owned business, and DB Resource Center, as well as some other initiatives in the safety arena for our internal staff for uh, uh, safety training. Uh, also, under the general operations uh, budget program is the data collections office. No change there other than the recommendation for merit-based pay. Again, this is on page 90 of the tracking document. Uh, and then in the Office of Planning, the Division of Planning, uh, no adjustment other than the merit-based pay adjustment there. And then finally, under General Operations is Traffic Management, and this is on page 91 of the tracking document. Uh, we have a $5 million ask, uh, additional ask, which was in the 17 budget. Part of that will go toward the merit-based pay. The other part of that will be deployed to the signal upgrades across the state and maintenance of traffic signals. Uh, across this state and putting the newest technology in. The next slide I want to share with you is sort of again sort of showing you the output of what these budget dollars actually do and I think this is a great slide and this shows the historical trend of procurement of going out and soliciting and, and doing uh, best value selections or qualification based selections of design consultants, environmental, and right of way. You can see here on this slide back in 2014, we did about 418 procurements. Last year in 2016, we did 561 procurements. All, uh, to the end of the last year, uh, this, in this physical year 17, we're on track at 469. So we've outpaced in six months what we did the entire 2014 or 2015 uh, independently. And when you translate that to dollars, you can see how many how these dollars are being deployed out in the private sector to provide design services and consultant services for environmental uh, and uh, right away in design. So right now, uh, 2016, we did $286 million out. You can see how much higher that was in 2014 and 15, and on track to surpass that this year. Again, pretty, pretty staggering numbers when you look at the amount of work. And, and by the way, you know, our procurement staff, we increased by two. So they're working very efficiently. It's a lot of work to go through these procurements to advertise, take, uh, do requests for qualifications, review those qualifications, make a selection, and then negotiate those. So hats off to our staff that really, really churn in the behind the scenes to get the output on the ground. The next budget category is the LMIG pro uh, program, Local Maintenance Improvement Grant. Again, this is the one-third population formula and the two-thirds road miles formula. Uh, allocated at 10% of the excise tax uh, amount, which totals $179 million. So this will be available to your cities and counties through their formula amount. As we continue to track this, last year it was about a 30% increase to prior to HB 170. This year takes us to about 31% over those previous years. So we're continuing to uh, improve those numbers, which certainly is much needed for our local governments, cities, and counties that have a backlog of need. The next budget program category is the routine maintenance category, again on page 91 of your tracking sheet. Uh, the additional, uh, the total is $448.7 million. That's an additional addition of $24.9 million, of which $1.8 million is going toward the merit-based pay adjustment. The remaining $23 million is going to go to a couple of things. One is to renew our statewide mowing contracts uh, where we've outsourced all our mowing so we can have more mowing, more litter pickup across the state. Uh, so we will do that and we will also uh, re-procure our I-95 comprehensive maintenance contract. So along I-95, uh, we don't have GDOT forces doing any of the, the normal maintenance out there. We've contracted all that out due to manpower. Uh, issues. So uh, we will continue to do that. So uh, that, that will consume that additional request of the 24.9. And when we think about the routine maintenance and talking about contracting that out, that's not a bad thing uh, because we have, our men and women have a backlog of work that they have to do anyway. 
And I, I throw this slide up there showing GDOT employees doing this, but this has now become the opportunity for private contractors to do this kind of work. And I wanted to give you an update on some of those activities that are going on. So far, we've signed up 158 contractors into this new arena to do business. It's never existed before to do this preventative or routine maintenance activity. In fact, uh, about 22% of those are DBE firms. That's been one of our initiatives to try to advance small business, veterans owns, and DBE. And we've seen about 11% DBE participation in the projects that we have awarded to date, which total $166 million. So again, trying to take care of our roadways, our roadsides, just doing the basics. Uh, tremendous investment, and we're very excited that we've got small business, DBEs, veteran-owned businesses in the arena trying to do that. This is my shameless plug where I always give you the website to tell your constituents to go to www.garoads.org, garoads.org. If anybody you know that can do small uh, construction type work, uh, tree service, uh, landscaping, vegetation management, all those kind of things, uh, we have a need for them throughout this state and need more than 158 that we have signed up now to do business. Also an update since the last time you saw, so you didn't get a rerun, I changed this slide. We talked about the new highway response program or the uh, uh, what we call the CHAMP Coordinated Highway Assistance and Maintenance Program. I showed you a picture last, uh, a graphic last time. We actually have the vehicles being deployed now of what those look like. And just by way of reminder, this is service patrol on all the interstates uh, through Georgia, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to provide aid to any stranded motorists and also do basic maintenance work along the way. Again, just glad, glad to see those trucks and they're gonna be rolling out there very, very soon. So again, by, by the end of the spring, we'll have statewide coverage in this program. Just dial 511 when you need them. The next budget category is payments to CERTA in uh, page 91 again in your tracking sheet. Uh, this is $104.049 million. Uh, a little bit of a fund source swap in replacing $36.5 million uh, from motor fuel to fees and an additional $10 million add uh, to the program which supports our partner who's here with us, the State Road and Tollway Authority, in administering and standing up a lot of the major mobility projects that we have on our 10-year plan. Uh, some of those, most of those have a toll component but there's no tolls being collected at this point. So there's a big procurement part, there's a big staffing, not necessarily staffing part, but a, rather a uh, get ready, work ready uh, part of that, that our partner with the State Road and Tollway Authority uh, needs to make that happen. So that was the $10 million ad there. And I know uh, Director Tomlinson will have more details about CERTA in his presentation. The final budget category to present today, uh, under this one, under this graphic is our geo debt service, which is $115 million. And this is the neat little part of the chart that's red on the bottom, and red's good in this case. Red is a budget reduction. So in fact, there was a, uh, there was a bu budget reduction due to a sinking fund. Uh, it was about $4 million uh, and was some refinance of our GRB bonds, again, which took the original debt from about 142 reduced it by 22.7 to give you the $115 million. So uh, good job to our, our GSFIC to uh, keep a focus on the opportunities to refinance any bond debt and to uh, get those savings to our citizens of Georgia by uh, reducing those uh, debt service. So uh, very good uh, that we see that. Uh, just as a note, uh, we have still about $2.35 billion of debt service. Uh, on the whole, that comes from over time, and those, those numbers will be falling off over time of which any of those savings we're redeploying into our financial plan, our 10-year plan to advance some of these major projects. Finally, our FY18 uh, uh, budget uh, recommendation for intermodal, which again is uh, generally state funds, is uh, $18.043 million, a $124,000 change. Not, I said a million one time, and Angela got really excited when I said $124 million exchange, but $124,000 change. And, and uh, most of that is merit-based pay of $125,000, but then there were some offsets due to reductions in Department of Administrative Services insurance 
and a few adjustments, moving some uh, about $1,800 from the department admin into that. You can see that in your tracking sheet. Uh, but uh, not any substantial changes to the intermodal program at $18 million. And again, uh, the budget, governor's budget recommendation for FY18 has $100 million in bonds for bridges again. I can't emphasize the, enough the importance of continuing to replace our deficient bridges on the state highway system and off. Now, these $100 million bonds will go toward de deploying about 25 to 26 of our state-owned bridges. We just had a, a meeting yesterday with our chief engineer where there's a bridge that's got federal funds on it on a U.S. route that's given us fits. This will be a perfect opportunity that we might can deploy state funds and get the project done sooner than later. Uh, so we're very grateful for having these kind of opportunities to take on our backlog of bridges. But when we're able to do these $100 million of bonds and move 25 or 26 bridges ahead to construction, it really has a compounding effect because it gives us the ability to fund, to work on the design, the environmental, and the necessary right of way to get them there. So it really frees up dollars to feed the pipeline to have more bridges ready to go. And so that's always a good thing. In fact, in 2017, we had 147 bridges that were being worked on in one way or another, that either through design, right of way, or environmental, or construction. So. That's beginning to touch about 10% of the bridges on an annual basis, advancing them ahead. So that's a good sustainable plan. And finally, I keep showing you this slide because when y'all, when you get those complaints and those calls, know that we're making progress. When you see these orange barrels out there, just know it's progress and send them our way. We'll be glad to take, talk to your constituents when they have concerns and reservations about potentially being impeded. We try to impede traffic as least as possible. But obviously, uh, as the saying goes, you have to break some eggs to make omelets. So we'll do our best in that, in that regard. Mr. Chairman, that concludes our FY18 presentation. I'll be glad to entertain any questions or comments. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. And I didn't give you a chance beforehand to, to introduce your staff, but uh, most of us know Angela and Meg, Mike, and everybody. But um, if you want to do that, I'd, I think it'd be good for the committee to, to hear that again because they do a, a great job putting all these – policies in place. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Indeed, it's truly a team effort, and we're, we're blessed with a fantastic staff through and through the department. We'll Starting in with Mike Dover, our Deputy Commissioner. Mike has the uh, jurisdiction and responsibility all of, over all our districts, so that's where you engage predominantly with your district engineers and the folks there. Mike's, Mike is, uh, guides and leads them, and I tell you what, he's doing a great job in the fact that he's empowering the districts to make the decisions and make that take care of business out there locally where it needs to happen and they know what they know best just like you do what's going on in your in your district and at home so we listen to them so mike does that and takes care of a lot of other offices as well such as admin and it and all the things that keep this agency running next to him is meg perkle our chief engineer and uh t a tough job in deploying getting all these projects out that's her job her mission is the delivery function the engineering function operations uh, policy for maintenance and operations a huge huge uh, job she has and doing a great job George Christensen sitting next to next to her and George is the person that works for all these numbers and so uh, I don't know how he goes home not without being cross-eyed trying to keep all these numbers and budget straight but does a fantastic job Selena Helms is next to him again from the budget office they this is who does the work they get all the credit they figure out how these budgets work and we say, can we do this and do that? And they'll go back and figure out how to make it happen, which is important. And of course, Treasurer Angela Whitworth, uh, again, uh, does a great job in leading them and making sure that we're being uh, efficient with our dollars. Also, from an accountability point of view, from an accounting point of view, that we've done a really good job in the last few years in our audits, uh, that you know things are in compliance and there's a good uh, comfort and transparency and accountability in what they do with a such large budget because when you have this kind of budget that comes with great responsibility and none of us sitting on this front row or me standing here take that very lightly. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for that thank recognition. Thank you. And you do have a question. We'll start with uh, Representative Rakestraw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know y'all are playing a lot of catch up since the funding is now coming through mm -hmm. to repair our roads and right. bridges. But um, a few years ago, my county had a plan that they had developed for a, a bypass road, a private partnership bypass toll road to bypass Atlanta mm -hmm. 
with all of the truck traffic coming out of Savannah. Right. Um, and I know they turned it over to y'all. Are y'all considering that, or is anybody dusting that off and looking at it? Because it's a great mm -hmm. program to really fix a lot of our transportation right. solutions. And even though we're paying, playing catch up, we've got to have a long-term transportation right. solution yeah. that's going to change the dynamics of the traffic. Yeah, absolutely. We, we actually uh, dusted that off about a year or so ago. Uh, that's something the director of planning has on his radar. It is a it is a big effort, and uh, we're trying to, like you say, take some catch up right now, trying to deploy some of the things where we need relief the most first. But freight mobility is something that you know is first and foremost on our on our minds. Um, that that's an interesting project. It has a lot of good features. It has some constraints. Uh, it would have to be some kind of public private toll facility, uh, and uh, that's something that I think we it's. I'd say we keep it right there on the horizon and keep looking for that and those kind of opportunities that come forward as we begin to gain ground and take, you know, get our assets in better condition first. You know, I'm really excited by, you know, the Joint Study Committee back in 2014 said you needed an additional billion dollars a year just to take good care of your conditions. That's about what we have, it's right, about additional billion, but yet we're leveraging and doing public privates to leverage about another 10 or 11 billion over 10 years. So, and to take on things, not necessarily like that, but we're gaining good ground in a very efficient way. So uh, we're very aware and that's something we will keep our eye on. I think, um, and one of the reasons I'm interested, well, a couple reasons, and, and it's not just for the, um, from the perspective of relieving traffic, but you know, if you look at all the economic development and growth in our state, it's like the whole eastern side of our state has it. And and if we can start doing something like that to bring some economic development to the western side of our state, then you're going to shift a lot of traffic patterns because you've got a lot of people driving from the west side to the east side to work. And just in in having that alternative road and the economic development it would bring, it would it would totally alleviate a lot of traffic coming from that side of town. And so um, I'm hoping that's something that you guys are really gonna take a serious look at and you know, and look at, you know, what we can do to make that happen. So and I'll, I'll just you. add to I'm excited that potentially maybe what we you know, some of the rumors you hear federally, if there was some kind of, you know, windfall federally, those kind of things would be big and bold that might fit in that kind of category. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Good point. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I know when we when you when you work when we're working on the seventeen amended budget, you just just briefly I can't remember the numbers, but you t you looked at historical number of employees with the department. Yes. I mean, in the last five or ten years, what does that look like? Because I know you have a, your right. workloads greater because you got this many right. more projects, but. You're doing it with less people, right? That's correct. We're uh, down a little over 700 people in the last six years. And so that's a pretty significant uh, reduction. We're at the lowest number ever. We're slightly under 3,900 full-time employees. We have about 140 temporary employees that work in the maintenance arena. They're temporary laborers, basically. And uh, we sort of use that a little bit as a proving ground. If they're a good candidate, then maybe we can move them into a full-time position. So. Uh, we're having to do things differently uh, as those numbers procurement numbers I showed you today we're doing a lot more outsourcing uh, but I think we're sort of when you look at the situation we're somewhat right-sized but we can't go any lower we need to stay at 3,900 to 4,000 employees uh, full-time employees to be able to just to be responsive especially in maintenance operations for emergencies you know we've had hurricanes snow and ice tornadoes all these things uh, when you, we have a, a significant event on a statewide level, it takes all hands to be able to just handle those things. And some of those things you just absolutely can't contract for in an emergency situation. So I think we're, I think we're sort of balanced out, but our goal is to maintain, and we desperately need to maintain 3,900 to 4,000 employees. Okay. And then I know the, uh, you, you touched on the, the, ch the new CHAMP program that's outside of the metro region, and that's kind of piggybacking on the success of the HERO program. Yes, and I know with the HERO, there's a corporate partner. Is that something y'all are looking at for the CHAMP program? It, it will be. And the first thing we want to do is just get this stood up as a, mm -hmm. a, in a procurement. And again, those are contractors doing that work. You won't know it. No, the public won't know it. They'll think it's a GDOT person. But uh, from a, you know, we want to make sure that people know that there's somebody to help them that's not going to want a credit card, you know, or, yeah. or you know, charge them for something. So we want to do that first, but that does have an opportunity. 
uh, for uh, par uh, sponsorship uh, as we did. He rose, if you notice, there's still room on that truck. It's not quite NASCAR like, but <laughs> we probably could put another sponsorship on that truck and that will be something we look to do again to offset, you know, to bring private dollars to offset state dollars would be fantastic. I'm going to ask you a question that I probably should know the answer to. But, um, you know, we're talking about the bond package and how successful it's been in being able to repair and replace a lot of these bridges. But when we talk about overpasses, I mean, is that part of that same bond package? I mean, or is, are we, is it all in the same, looked at the same way? Well, we're looking at on the, on the bridges, we're looking at bridge replacements predominantly, not necessarily building a new overpass, but overpasses are in that category. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about all the overpasses over the interstates, not interchange, but just the overpasses, they were all built when the interstate system were built. So they far exceeded their 50 year life already. So those bridges fall in that. Uh, we try to deploy most of these though, based on structural deficiency first and foremost. Usually the overpass bridges don't have a lot of structural deficiency. Uh, but we're trying to get the bridges over the rivers, the streams, and all those critical bridges first. And uh, Meg's staff and the bridge office use a very uh, complicated formula based on condition, based on uh, locations to hospital schools, uh, power plants, you know, critical assets, state assets, that if there was a problem with that bridge and it had to be closed, you, you look at your detour route. So they take a very strategic look at and prioritizing those and sort of work their way in that prioritization uh, every year. So the crew, the, the, the divers that go down and inspect the underwater portions of the bridges, are those GDOT employees or contract employees? They're GDOT employees. And uh, they get a, that's a, a crazy job they do because the visibility is usually zero. I, I don't, Commissioner, I don't see any more questions, but I can keep asking them if you want. But um, uh, we're here I don't for you. see any other. Hold on. Wow, I have some. Question. I, uh, you obviously know where I'm from, and uh, you know my last meeting I had over GDOT was probably five or six years ago when I had a pretty good bird in my saddle when I got over there, and <clears throat> probably wasn't as polite as I should have been. But uh, I just got to say, in the last two or three years, particularly with this new funding, uh, all the things that you've done in our area around the ports, the Jimmy Loach Parkway, the Virgin Diamond, now you're going to repave I-95 all the way from 16. Uh, to South Carolina and all the products are on board. I just can't believe that you've done this as expediently as you have and, and moved forward. It's, uh, you've done a tremendous job and I certainly appreciate it. My constituents are thrilled with the Diverging Diamond. Correct. I mean, that That's was correct. my number one complaint for the last mm -hmm. three years. So right. thank you very well, much. Thank you for that acknowledgement and, and understand <coughs> that still, we're still ramping up. I mean, to see the, see the outcomes or it's still going to take another year or two to fully understand what the new norm will look like, which is, is fantastic. I have one final question, and that's in regards to the, your, your debt service. As far as just take us back, I mean, how is our – you said the debt service now. How much was it? Two? We, yeah, it's a little over $2 billion. And that's that's combination of federal, which is called guaranteed revenue uh, vehicles, the Garvey debt. And those are those – are, uh, that's a form of debt that is pledged against your future federal funds. So we use our federal, uh, federal uh, authorization <coughs> amounts uh, every year to have to pay that back. So part of that comes from the federal program. And then obviously there's GO debt and GRB debt that is funded at the state level of which you see in the, that's, that's the state component uh, in the budget presentation there. Angela just gave me the number. Um, so uh, let me get to the, yeah, the total total debt load that goes out to the year 2034 is 2.4 uh, billion. Now that drives down every year. It gets we're, we've sort of ridden the curve, if you will, sort of sort of almost hit the peak and then it will fall off. Now understand that's not found money. We in our financial planning, as the debt load falls off, the debt that's freed up or the dollars that are freed up, either federal or state. <coughs> Are redeployed in our 10-year plans that's going to projects. So uh, we're, we're watching that prize and, and uh, George has got a spreadsheet that'll blow your mind and, and a database that uh, goes out. I think we're out to the year 2054 or so, uh, planning all the way out there. So, uh, you know, that's one of those things that uh, we're in good shape. We're, we've, we've sort of hit the peak, but we're counting on the, on the, the downside of the curve, if you will, to deploy to go to other projects. And then you, I, get, uh, I promise this is my last question. 
you mentioned that in the numbers in your presentation that none of the TIA number, the, the TSPLOS numbers, the right. three regions are reflected in this, That's but correct. there are, you do have a lot of administrative expenses involved in that. Is that included in this or is that no. all separate? No, TIA, TIA is all separate. Uh, the administration piece, which is a very small piece, we have three employees that's administering the total three region program. And uh, it's a very small piece of those, but those are built into the project budgets themselves. And each TIA region had a line item. They had one line item for the administration of the projects themselves. So they're very self-sufficient. Uh, now, every, every now and then they may charge to a state, a state program for looking at something that, you know, is not part of the scope of the TIA project. But that is a very efficient, again, self-contained, uh, self-contained program. That is uh, really the, you know, again, those those dollars, uh, uh, sales tax dollars, are held over by GSFIC, so they they don't really encumber into our budget. We we have to make a request to pay those bills uh, to them and and uh, pay the either pay contractors, counties, or cities, or in our in our case ourselves. I'm looking for nods. Yep, very right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, um, Commissioner, thank you again, and, and to your staff, thank you all for what you do. Uh, we're awfully proud of you, of, of, of the infrastructure we have, and look forward to continuing to, to work with you all to continue to improve it. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Thank you. And next, uh, we'll move on to uh, Director Tomlinson with uh, – it always wears, we're kind of used to you wearing two hats now because you've been doing it a while, but yeah. with Gerda and Serta, good to have you and, uh, and Mr. Stancil back there. Well, thank you for having me get this presentation up here. So good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I got to tell you, the commissioner, it, between your questions and, and the commissioner's uh, answers, he's covered a lot of uh, the things where there's overlap. So Good. Uh, yeah, so we'll keep it moving. Uh, same thing, um, you've seen some of these slides before, so I'm not going to um, bore you by going, giving you a rerun. But the one thing about this slide that I, I uh, shared with you before, um, on the Peach Pass numbers, the last time you saw this slide, uh, we had a number of around 300,000 um, for accounts and around... Um, I think we had 550,000 uh, listed for peach passes. Um, <clears throat> since I last appeared, uh, 7,000 new accounts have been opened, over 10,000 additional peach passes have been issued. Obviously, this is being driven by the uh, 75 South project. Um, our customer service center is processing now anywhere from 900 to 1,300 orders for uh, peach passes each day, and we're uh, handling 750 to 1,500 calls per day this week. So people are getting them. You know, we always wish they'd get them a little bit sooner than the road opening, but we're used to the crush and, and um, we're, we're handling it. Uh, jumping right into the budget numbers. Uh, starting first with uh, the CERTA um, budget recommendations. So and this is on uh, section 47, page 91 of the uh, uh, tracking sheet. but. The commission already talked about this $36 million fund source. So again, that isn't a, a net increase or decrease, but it's just changing the fund source from what were motor fuel dollars to general funds. Uh, again, the thought there is that go ahead and put the motor fuel into the transportation program, into the transportation projects. The money that comes over to us is largely related to debt service, and I'm going to uh, break that down a little bit um, more for you here in a second. Uh, the commissioner talked about the $10 million uh, coming over as a uh, recommendation. That provides money, as the commissioner already stated, for a ramp up for all of these managed land projects that are either under construction now and or coming online this year and next year. Uh, the plan is 75 South opened. Uh, next year in the spring of 2018, the Northwest Corridor is slated to open. And then later on in the year, around fall of 2018, the uh, extension to the I-85 hot lanes, or if we're now calling the I-85 uh, uh, North uh, project is, is scheduled to open. So again, we were talking about that startup and ramp up for maintenance, um, processing um, license plate lookups, our customer service center costs, uh, the natural gas generator power backup systems, uh, uh, et cetera. The balance of the funds that you see, that $111.6 million in state funds, is largely for the debt service on, on the Garvey program. So if you turn to the next slide, 
sort of break down what the funds that come over from the department are used for. So again, talked about the 10 million. What's in our base budget already is approximately 13 million for the infrastructure bank program. The remaining debt service, approximately uh, uh, state funds, approximately 88.6 million, is tied to about 150 million dollars in federal funds. This is the Garvey program that the commissioner spoke of, giving us um, a little over 240 million dollars that goes towards debt service. If you look at the bottom of that sheet. For this portion of the Garvey's and, and guaranteed revenue bonds and what's called GRRBs, but uh, guaranteed uh, refunded revenue bonds, <laughs> it's going to help reduce debt service. We'll be at about $714.5 million for the, the bonds that we manage with, through these payments. Uh, by the time we get to the end of fiscal year 18, the, the principal outstanding amount will be about $510 million. These are, again, bonds that go through CERTA, the proceeds of which went into transportation um, programs such as the Fast Forward uh, program from years ago. We're still paying the debt on that. So I know it's a little bit complex, but we work hand in hand on that. Um, if you're wondering, the $111.6 million figure in state funds, uh, the commissioner mentioned $104 million. The difference is $7.6 million in state funds that was already in the um, base budget. So he spoke about all the uh, changes. So there is no discrepancy. Our numbers tie out. So moving to the Greta budget, there's two pieces in the governor's uh, uh, recommendation. We generally receive about $12.9 million. Um, you're going to see this in several agencies, this uh, merit system adjustment. Because a lot of our funds as an authority do not come from appropriated funds, the portion in, in our budget for those merit system adjustments is only about $30,000. And uh, the rest of it comes from our other funding sources, which are largely um, uh, Federal Transit Administration uh, grants. The other thing that's included is uh, a recommendation for $2 million in GEO bond funds uh, to go towards park and ride expansion uh, around uh, the Sugarloaf area. And I'll probably do a little uh, background. So take it up to a high level. For, the, for Greta, we generally receive in our base budget $12.9 million. About $2.5 million goes to admin and overhead rents, personnel costs, uh, just generally agency administration. The remaining $10.4 million goes directly into the express service. The last time I was before this committee, you were asking, well, exactly how do you pay for express? And I talked about there's the appropriation, there's the fare box, and there's federal grants. So what you see on this slide is, is a more specific uh, breakdown. So 10.4 million of the 12.9 uh, million goes directly into the express program. We receive about 5.8 million dollars in fare box recovery. That's literally what the passengers are paying and contributing towards the service. About 6.7 million dollars in Federal Transit Administration uh, grant funding goes into it. The 1.8 million, the 175,000 are really just small pieces, but basically it's money that was uh, held over in our fund balance, and honestly, it keeps us from making a request. We did not request any additional funds for operations for the express service, but those are sort of the legs of the stool that funds the entire express service. Turning to the $2 million request for GO bonds. So what you see on the picture is uh, right off of uh, Sugarloaf on I-85, there's actually two parking rides. One we call the Sugar Loaf Park and Ride. It's built in right of way that's owned by GDOT, is operated and maintained um, by Gwinnett County. They run service out of uh, that lot, so do we. On the far right, um, you, uh, the large circle, we are leasing spaces from Sugar Loaf Mills, from, essentially from the mall, uh, and we pick up passengers over there. This is a very strategic lot for both us as well as um, uh, Gwinnett uh, County Transit. We run three uh, routes out of there. They run uh, four. In April of this year, we plan to add service from that location to Perimeter. And, and they're planning on adding service from that lot uh, to uh, the Emory campus. So when you look at the, the demand, it's a popular location. 
the money here is for us to be able to ex expand uh, park and ride capacity. Hopefully uh, acquire additional land to expand where people can park and get on the service because all the buses from here, both us and Gwinnett, get onto the highway and they use the I-85 um, express lanes. Um, and those routes for both us and Gwinnett are amongst our most um, reliable and popular routes. So we really need to address this uh, growth and demand in the area. And that is everything that we have in the FY18 budget. I'm more than happy to take questions. Well, thank you, sir. Um, we'll start with uh, Representative Rakestraw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I wondered if you guys have a plan, because I know you, you work with like Cobb County Transit, Gwinnett Transit, the Express, you know, all the different bus buses. And I notice, like when you come in, you know, to the downtown area, like on the interstates and on the downtown roads, there will be, you know, a, a Gwinnett bus, a Cobb County bus, an express bus. And have y'all looked at consolidating routes and, you know, making it easier for customers and, and clearing up a lot of the traffic congestion that the buses create by having so many that are coming from the same areas versus having to having people coming in on three different buses. Yep. Uh, Representative Rakestraw, I love your questions. Can I just say that? It, this is something that we spend a lot of time in trying to plan and coordinate. Um, and there's multiple levels of that. Um, so with the Sugarloaf uh, area, we are literally sitting down and planning and coordinating uh, our service and their service to make sure there aren't conflicts. In terms of um, duplication of services, and trying to streamline. But yeah, we're, we're in discussions with them uh, all the time. Right now, last year in September, we changed our routing. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different than them to limit or reduce the number of streets downtown that we're on, to stick to more of the one-way streets. So you will now see Express um, operating more on um, Peachtree Center and Central Avenue, one-way streets, and coming back on Spring Street. Um, the express service is no longer doing what we call the local loops, like um, going onto the side streets to get to the federal center. It was actually a, a little bit controversial, but we thought it made a lot of sense to be able to have more consistent run times and to um, reduce how much we contribute to the congestion downtown by being on all the streets. Um, in terms of uh, duplication of services, um, we run 25 of the express routes in the region. Uh, Gwinnett uh, currently runs three. They're looking at ex expanding. Uh, Cobb, I believe, has three as well. So we represent the majority of the service. Uh, there have been discussions um, over the years about unification so that everything was on the same um, pricing. There's only one set of buses, one master schedule. Um, those uh, discussions are ongoing, and I wouldn't be surprised if it comes up during all the discussions of transit governance. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be a good thing to look at. Yeah. So, um, interesting story. After we met the last time, and y'all talked about the rehabbing of your buses and the breaking down, and you know, needing to rehab and that appropriation. Um, I think the next day or the day after, there was one of your buses broken down on I-20, blocking traffic. <laughs> so I'm like, was that intentional? I get anyway. it. <laughs> that definitely was not, but I get a daily report on um, um, buses and, and they're um, breaking down. The mechanics are old and at least it's service calls. So Well, you made I, your point. I'm glad you saw it. <laughs> Once yeah. is enough to see it. And uh, we, obviously we try to reduce that. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, when I was growing up and school buses got that old, we'd just cut the backs off of them and use them to haul soybeans in <laughs> down to where I'm from. <laughs> Hey. All right, Chairman Strickland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're not even a week in yet, but um, so far what you're seeing with reversible lanes in Henry County, is it going as expected so far? Um, it's going as expected so far. If anything, it's probably um, better than expected. Um, on Monday, we went together a week's worth of data, and we plan to release um, uh, some trip data. Um, but um, I, I can't remember which... Uh, committee meeting we're in um, but right now based on sort of the internal guesses uh, we're seeing more trips than anyone had initially guessed 
And yes, I've seen the, the articles where people are saying it's, it's still free flow. Keep in mind, again, we added two additional lanes where there was only three. Um, and I, I think uh, everyone I've talked to that's using them uh, really likes them. So. I can tell you I left here um, yesterday about 5 o'clock, which normally I wouldn't do just to test it. <laughs> and traffic was flowing uh, through Eagles Landing area at 5 o'clock, about 5.30 by the time I got down there. Um, like I haven't seen in a long time. So hopefully that's not just a one-time thing. Maybe it'll impact not just those that are using the actual new lanes, but everyone else is still on the other lanes as well. And, and I was happy to hear those numbers. I was going to ask you about that. You've already given those numbers. How many folks have bought peach passes over the last week as well? Uh, they're buying them. We saw a, a rush on, through the 31st. We had a special where we gave an additional $10 credits. And um, they actually, the, the website uh, start to go down right before midnight with the, the last minute rush. So yeah. our version of sort of the tax deadline. So it was very interesting. But yeah, people, people are using it. To your point, we are hoping that over time uh, there's an equilibrium where uh, the number of people who use the lanes, again, it can help improve uh, in the general purpose. But what we saw on, I believe it was Tuesday morning, there was an accident right around Hudson Bridge Eagles Landing uh, in the morning, which uh, stopped the traffic uh, in the general purpose lane. And um, those that um, were in the express lanes literally just flew, flew on past it. Uh, I think that, too, also contributed to the amount of people that started signing up for yeah. the peach passes that day. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, speaking of the peach pass, I still I, – I bought one, but I hadn't where, – where do you put it on your on your window? I, I'm going home question. about 5 o'clock, and I'm going to try that thing out. Hmm? So, so – We got um, another meeting. Uh, it, you peel it off, and you put it um, on the glass, um, either right behind or right below your rearview mirror. Uh, okay. That's the I. So if now that while the tolls are free until February the tenth, do you still have to have it on there? You still have to have it on there. What's it going to happen if I don't? Is it going to start beeping at me? Or my car going to shut off? Or? No, it doesn't beep. Uh, we, we don't do anything with the cars, uh, but you, you do uh, run the risk of getting a, a violation notice. Um, we know that I'd everyone's have to call my Henry County attorney it. then. We know everyone's getting used to. It. There might be some warnings, but. Um, It'll be a different story after February 10th. <laughs> okay. Well, any more questions from the committee? I don't see any. Uh, oh, 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 here we go. Laid out on. My vice chairman, F. Stration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director. I apologize I missed the presentation, but on my previous subcommittee, I know I've been able yes. to hear your presentation before. I just wanted to thank you for uh, engaging with me and working with me, discussing congestion relief, how to address uh, that. That's certainly an issue that's – um, uh, on my constituents' minds. I just really appreciate you being willing to talk with me about that, and thank you for what you're doing. Anytime. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, I don't see any more questions. Thank you for all you do, and I'm looking forward to, to trying that express lane out today heading south. All right, you'll not, as not as much as I'm just looking forward to seeing Atlanta in my rearview mirror. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>